You're watching ACC Update on CardioSource Video News. Coming up, the ACC's Adult Congenital and Pediatric Cardiology section is spearheading an effort to establish a new subspecialty certification. And later, we'll examine the latest research from the National Cardiovascular Data Registry and how this research is being applied in the real world. And don't miss our discussion with ACC President Dr. Ralph Brindis, where we'll discuss quality reporting, MOC, health IT, and other issues facing today's cardiologists. From the American College of Cardiology in Washington, D.C., this is ACC Update. Welcome to this edition of the ACC Update for January. I'm Lisa Fletcher. The American College of Cardiology's Adult Congenital and Pediatric Cardiology section has made great strides in developing a cohesive strategy that addresses the legislative, workforce, and training issues pediatric and congenital cardiologists and surgeons face daily. Identifying and strengthening educational opportunities has been a specific priority. In fact, the ACPC section is spearheading a multi-society effort to establish a subspecialty certification in adult congenital heart disease with the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Board of Pediatrics. Paul Miles, Senior Vice President and Director of Quality Improvement and Practice Assessment Programs at the American Board of Pediatrics, recently talked with ACC about that opportunity for congenital cardiology providers. Uh, one of the activities that uh, pediatric cardiologists can participate in for Part 4 credit is a national collaborative uh, around hypoplastic left heart, uh, and the ACC has been very supportive of that. There are some educational programs that can be uh, um, presented at national meetings, and there will be one coming up in the meeting in New Orleans in 2011 that pediatric cardiologists can get Part 2 maintenance of certification credit. Learn more about the Adult Congenital and Pediatric Cardiology section in the ACC section of Cardiosource.org. After a successful first year of recruiting more than 900 organizations and more than 1,400 individuals, the H2H initiative is starting the new year with a call to action. Over the course of 2011, H2H participants can take part in special H2H challenges related to post-discharge medication management, early follow-up and symptom management. The first challenge will be announced this month. For more information or to enroll, visit h2hquality.org. Also, don't miss the H2H Learning Destination at ACC 11 in New Orleans, the result of a partnership with Philips Healthcare. This new innovative learning environment will complement the ACC's ongoing efforts to reduce cardiovascular-related hospital readmissions. Newly published research from the National Cardiovascular Data Registry showcases the many ways registry data is being applied to real-world research questions. For example, recent data from the Outpatient Pinnacle Registry found that uninsured patients are less likely to receive evidence-based medication treatment for coronary artery disease, but not for heart failure. Another study using data from the CATH PCI Registry shows patients with non-obstructive coronary artery disease receive fewer secondary prevention therapies than those with obstructive CAD. This and other recent research are proof that registries can be powerful tools when it comes to improving quality and outcomes. The ACC continues to educate clinicians, members of Congress, health policymakers, and other medical specialties about the value of these tools. This April, the ACC will celebrate 60 years of cutting edge and innovative science and education for cardiovascular professionals in New Orleans. New this year, ACC members can register for the VIP Full Access Pass. The pass includes VIP seating in the main education room, access to a special member lounge, and personalized assistance with navigating the Big Easy. Other member-only highlights include the annual chapter reception and reduced registration fees. New this year for everyone, 11 learning pathways, expanded interactive learning experiences, lifelong learning and recertification opportunities, and 17 international lunchtime symposia. After the break, we'll be joined in studio by ACC President Dr. Ralph Brindis. Stay with us. Something extraordinary is stirring. Something so exciting, it can't be contained. And when it opens, you'll experience the world of cardiology 
like you've never experienced it before. Science. Innovation. Education. Networking. Intervention. Cardiology and New Orleans converge at ACC 11 and I2 Summit 2011, the 60th annual scientific session and expo, and I2 Summit 2011 is an event you don't want to miss. Register today. Go to www.accscientificsession.org for more information. Improve your clinical expertise in non-coronary vascular disease. Register today for the third annual Clinical Practice of Peripheral Vascular Disease, happening February 11th through the 13th, 2011, at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Phoenix. For more information, visit www.cardiosource.org slash pvd2011. Cardiovascular professionals across the U.S. are facing increasing demands for quality reporting, maintenance of certification, and health IT, and at the same time, reimbursement continues to drop, and coding and preauthorization burdens on practices are on the rise. I'm pleased to be joined by ACC President Ralph Brindis, who says the way cardiovascular professionals respond to this changing healthcare landscape will determine the future. Welcome, Dr. Brindis. Thanks well, for being here. It's a thrill to be here. <laughs> How would you describe the options for cardiovascular professionals right now in terms of responding to these healthcare options? You know, we really are under attack right now. Uh, people really want to bend the cost curve and decrease the, the rise of uh, health care costs in the United States. Appreciate that 43% of all costs of uh, Medicare, for example, are cardiovascular. The cardiovascular specialist is a target. We have to figure out how to respond in terms of letting the public know, letting our uh, legislators know, letting the payers know what we bring to the table so that we can uh, deliver the proper care to our patients. We are entering an environment that clearly we're going to start paying for quality rather than quantity. So us as cardiovascular uh, professionals need to be ready for that, uh, for that change in the way that health care is going to be reimbursed in terms of physician payment reform. What about the risks of being perceived as knaves or pawns in this whole arena? Well, that's an excellent question. I mean, we are cardiovascular professionals, and as people try to decrease the cost curves and uh, are looking at doctors as maybe not having the right values, and I, I think this is a, a tremendous disservice to our patients and certainly not reflecting of uh, fellows of the American College of Cardiology. But if we were viewed as knaves and pawns, people would view us as being part of the problem in terms of uh, practicing medicine where we're uh, doing tests for our own financial gain that have no value to the patient, that are waste to the healthcare, that our motives are, are impure, that are narcissistic, and that we're not uh, patient-centered. A very unfair comment, but again, you feel those pressures or those feelings in the public sometimes. For example, just two weeks ago on the Dr. Oz show, uh, he claimed that 50% of all coronary stents in the United States that are placed are not needed. A total misrepresentation uh, of the facts of, of the truth of interventional cardiology and clearly doing a disservice to our patients. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking about knaves and pawns. What do you see as opportunities for knights? Well, I like to believe that uh, uh, the cardiology community in the United States, our fellows, are actually knights. And that really is the, the call of professionalism uh, uh, for us uh, physicians. If we were really viewed as knights, we would be viewed as the answers in terms of uh, what quality of care should be for our patients. Uh, the uh, payers, the government would look to us as to what are the right ways of delivering care. Uh, we would be looked to, look towards as a source in terms of health care reform. Uh, that we would be leaders in terms of figuring out physician payment. We would be leaders in terms of how we could differentiate and, and evaluate quality of care. Uh, and uh, I am proud that the American College of Cardiology is producing a lot of these infrastructure tools that can make us truly be the knights that we are in the eyes of the public. Give me a couple examples of those. Well, of course, the, the, uh, I think the treasure of the college right now is our clinical practice guidelines and our performance measures and our National Cardiovascular Data Registry, which is in 2,500 hospitals with 11 million patient records. 
but we're building a lot of other infrastructure tools, our appropriate use criteria, which is a way of making sure that we're delivering the right care to the right patient at the right time and minimize the chance of doing inappropriate testing. And we have other, uh, other tools, such as our ambulatory care registry, uh, Pinnacle, and even our, uh, we now have now a new partnership with uh, Society of Cardiovascular Angiography and Intervention, uh, the ACE initiative, where we'll be accrediting cath labs in terms of excellence for delivery of care in the uh, interventional suites. Dr. Brindis, thanks so much for being here. It's my pleasure. And join us next month for all the latest news and information on your college. I'm Lisa Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.